When I first left home, I came to Canberra because I've always sought out the exciting life. I studied art history at the Australian National University. I reckon they must be proud. My first job in Canberra was here at the National Gallery shop as a checkout chick selling thinly veiled Australiana. My favourite item in the shop was the kangaroo mug. It has a print of an engraving by the famous English artist George Stubbs. <laughs> he rebuilt a roo from skins and skulls given to him by Joseph Banks in 1770. And then he painted it. The image became a symbol of the Australian continent and at the time it was copied and copied and copied. It was also a wallaby. Like Stubbs's kangaroo, the Australian identity that was being forged at the turn of the 20th century was a bit of a mistake in construction. Going to give him life. This Frankenstein national icon was pieced together from the body parts of shearers, soldiers, larrikins, drovers and old mates. <laughs> Sadly, the most popular paintings of the early 20th century don't offer an alternative to Australia as a blokey McBorlockville. Like Stubbs's Rue, this image of the bloke has been repeated so often, it's become the only identity we know. If the quintessential Australian was indeed the pioneer bloke man, you can make one of two assumptions. Either women contributed nothing to the foundation of Australia, or any contribution they did make was actively ignored. In this episode, I want to use art to explore the genesis of Australia's obsession with its hyper-masculine identity. With the help of some early 20th century female painters and some contemporary artists, I'm going to try to uncover an alternate portrait of a more ladylike Australia. I'm going to show you what I see, what I don't see, and what I want to see. I'm Hannah Gatsby, and this is my Oz. <laughs> Last episode, we talked about the colonial era, when Australia was just a collection of colonies tethered to England. In this episode, we fast forward to Federation in 1901, when that collection of colonies was stitched together to form an independent nation that was tethered to England. This is literally the birth of our nation, as captured by one of our most celebrated artists, Tom Roberts. The hundreds of important people in attendance Note the ratio of men to women. I'm not entirely sure that's appropriate for a birth. Although it's kept here in Canberra on permanent loan, this painting is owned by the Queen. To be honest, I'm not too fussed if she keeps it. It's an awful painting. And Tom Roberts would agree. You can ask him, but you'd be best reminded that he's dead. One thing you can assume is that Tom Roberts didn't believe this nation was born in that dusty old room. Tom Roberts believed that this nation, Australia, was born in the bush. That's bush. More bush. Definitely bush. Classic bush. The golden age of Australian painting is considered to be the years around Federation, with such artists as Tom Roberts, Arthur Streeton and Frederick McCubbin. You're looking at the heads of the Heidelberg School. These guys were the rock stars of Australian art. A young, passionate, Keen to get out there and see the world and paint Australia. <laughs> Although they revolutionised art in Australia, they're also partly responsible for the hyper-masculine image that we're stuck with even now. I love this painting. It's so evocative. I've known many a day like this, menacingly hot, with a glare that could melt your retinas. And it's this acknowledgement of a distinctly Australian light that has made Streeton and his pals so well loved to this very day. But within this drama of light and rock, another human drama is unfolding. Someone has been hurt in a blast and is being carried out on a stretcher. Australia was a tough and dangerous place to build. That's the story. These Heidelberg paintings are still our most iconic artistic depictions of Australia. They show our fledgling national pride embodied in pictures of an all-male pioneering workforce of tradies. 
The most famous of the working bushman genre, however, is shearing of the rams. Men doing manly things in a shed. Looking at paintings like this, you'd think women played no part in building this country at all. And if you think I'm playing the feminist card a bit too hard, then stop being such sissy bitches and think of the title, Shearing of the Rams. Rams are boy sheep. Tom Roberts has gendered his painting. He has made a deliberate choice, and he chose the male version of the sheep. But as most blokes in hats know, most farm sheep are ladies. Ironically, the ram shearing day is the gentlest, most tender of all the shearing days because they had to be very careful not to shear off their big rammy balls. <laughs> the great irony of the Heidelberg School's tough bush blokes is that the artists themselves were all just gentlemen from the city. And speaking of city boys living in the bush, look at those soft little hands. I'm back with Ben Quilty to sniff a bit of clag and ask him why these city blokes were painting Australia in this way. Keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> I had a studio on the Hawkesbury River up in a little town called Windsor, and it's when I thought street was pretty uncool, and I suddenly realised that as a 21-year-old man who walked along the edge of the creek and set his little old-fashioned easel up somewhere, and for the first time in that part of Australia, for a European artist to depict the landscape truthfully, not romanticising it in some English vision. It was sort of the beginning of Aussie pride, for want of a better meaning. They actually embraced what the place looked like. A lot of work. Yeah. It was a lot of work paint, a and lot well, of work in there. Well, for tall, you know, it was the truth. If you're given a plot of land and you could cut all the trees down with your bare hands, then you're going to make money. So it's a land of opportunity. Yeah, young and free. So the Aussie pioneer was an important icon for our flourishing nation. His chopping, sawing and blowing up of the landscape became a symbol of the conquering of this continent. Ben's painting, Golden Soil, Wealth for Toil, playfully undermines this iconic masculine portrait. Riffing on Robert's famous bushranger painting, Bailed Up, Quilty's renaming of the original work directly questions that cherished line from our national anthem. Exactly what kind of toil is robbery? The bushman is now transformed from conqueror to exploiter. The axe and saw becoming as useful as the bushranger's gun in the robbery of this land's natural resources. We're left to question how long will our soil be golden if we keep toiling it willy-nilly. So shame posed like that. The idea of the all-conquering male doesn't totally define the more nuanced 21st century bloke. In these paintings, Ben's portrayal of the male form is more complex. The figures are more vulnerable and unsure. Like this Francis Bacony bloke. I'm pretty sure that's a bloke. He's definitely looking a bit vulnerable. I was part of this young masculine culture that believed in, you know, masculinity is this flourishing madness of, of strength and, and sexuality. I, I don't really know where that fits in anymore. So all of my work's become about deconstructing it and trying to understand it. All my work's autobiographical because you can say anything you want about yourself. What would you like to say about yourself right now? <laughs> I don't wear a tie, but I do have a penis. Mm. <laughs> I like the way Ben questions his own masculinity within the broader context of a questionable national identity. Because let's face it, the macho, macho Australian man isn't questioned enough. I think part of the trouble is that mainstream Australia still hasn't gotten over its bromance with the Heidelberg bush bears. Despite appearances, the Heidelberg School was in fact a co-ed. There were girls painting amongst the boys. Artists like Jane Sutherland, Clara Southern, May Vale and Jane Price were part of this school of art. In recent years, there's been a push to put Jane Sutherland on the Heidelberg top shelf with Roberts and Co. But debate lingers as to her worthiness with mutterings about her purply palette and domesticated fenced-in settings. Personally, I'm a fan, and maybe it's just because she existed at all, and I get to see that world through a woman's eyes. 
Australia's obsession with the tough bush bloke has created a monster, leaving our culture bereft of the histories and images of so many other Australians, in particular those of our pioneer women. I've come to South Australia to visit artist Sue Kneebone, who likes to assemble her own kind of monsters. In a series of works called Naturally Disturbed, Kneebone creates intriguing narratives around her pioneering family. Using photographs, artefacts and large doses of speculation, she's produced some haunting images that explore complex personal and national histories. So this is your great-grandfather and grandmother, and that's not how they've looked. You sort of Frankensteined a couple ah, of heads there. Yes, yes, certainly. They were married in the late 1890s. So that's Arthur, that's Mabel. I have transmogrified them with goats and sheep's heads that are collected from the pastoral property. Made them habitat. part of the landscape. Yeah, yeah, they've sort of become colonial beasts, I guess. The gun? Yeah, made out of goat bones. Not a landscape. powerful weapon then? Uh, no, a metaphorical weapon. Metaphorical, yeah, yeah. which is just as powerful, yeah, actually. Yeah. By including ram's heads, bat faces, genetically modified wheat and extinct birds, Sue implicates herself and her ancestors. It's a story that echoes Ben Quilty's questionings of the myth of the conquering bush hero, suggesting that white settlement has come at a cultural and environmental cost. So I get the sense you've kind of exhumed the past, you've brought it back to life. What does that say about your present? Oh, I, I like that past to live on the present to remind us it still hovers. That that past may still have implications or ramifications, especially in regard to the environment. I'm interested in that sort of nature culture division and why it's settlers looking at nature as something outside of themselves. Like so much of our country's history, female contribution is poorly acknowledged. The story of Sue's grandmother, Mabel, is simply not part of the documented family history. So Kneebone's work invents these lost narratives. I can only make conjectures of her being a good domestic housewife. I can imagine her being quite alone while Arthur's out there making the dingo fence or managing the property. The absence of her voice was probably one of the most frustrating things. She's almost ghostly. She does remain as a ghostly presence, yeah. Sue's work recognises the contribution, or at least the existence of women, in the founding of this country. I mean, she had to make the stories up, but that's not to say they're not true. She could be a really good guesser. All in all, these complex works are a welcome antidote to the images of blokes in hats who work alone. Although, let's not forget Frederick McCubbin, who did actually include these rather necessary tools for building a nation, a baby maker the ultimate wedding gift. This triptych, The Pioneer, is his most famous painting. In it, McCubbin gives the viewer a chance to contemplate the contribution of women. Although let's not get too excited and call him a feminist, the painting is called The Pioneer, singular, and I'm pretty sure that's not the baby's name. As well as his inclusion of women, McCubbin sets himself apart from his Heidelberg chums by giving his bush a twang of the melancholy and a touch of the untamable. Miranda! Get your ass back down here now! I'm walking around Mount Macedon doing my best Edith, the fat girl impression from Picnic at Hanging Rock. Miranda! Australia has a history of lost children. Look. There's one there. G'day, little fella. This is Frederick McCubbin's Lost, which portrays the true story of Clara Crosby, who went missing in the wilderness for two weeks in 1886. Where the pioneer man was all conquering, the lost child is vulnerable. In these images, the Australian bush is threatening, melancholic and mysterious. Heidi? This is ridiculous. I've lost contemporary artist Heidi Yardley, who was going to interview about her series of paintings called Darklands, inspired by the lost school children of Hanging Rock. Hannah! Heidi! Hi! 
Hey. Nice to meet you. You too. Would you like to come for a picnic on the rock with me? I would love to. The idea within the exhibition that I had was to use notions of being lost in the wilderness. That could be either being lost in a joyous way with some sort of abandon or being sucked in against your will. It also ties in with the idea of British colonisation and being lost in this land that was so far away from Europe. Heidi's themes remind me of Sue Kneebone's Victorian era ancestors, who were also at odds with the landscape in which they lived. The lost child becomes a metaphor for the anxieties of white settlers and their uneasy sense of belonging in a land they did not really understand. But Yardley's images of the girls are charged with sexuality and hint at a possible rebellion, suggesting that rather than being taken by the land, they gave themselves to it, turning away from their restrictive society. Pioneer blokes would never have abandoned themselves to the land. They were too busy conquering it. At best, they might have had a quick wank behind a rock. The land, it's so primeval that these buttoned up, laced up, who wears inappropriate clothing? <laughs> British in the bush. You know, girls, the contrast is so great that they get swallowed up. For me, the, that's sort of the answer to the mystery is that they simply ceased to exist because they couldn't. It's just like two different worlds clashing. And that's very much white Australians in Australia. Era, Australia's identity up-anchored itself from ideas and images based around the bush and set sail for foreign shores, where a new identity would be forged from blood and sacrifice. By all accounts, the Great War was anything but great, and too many lives were lost on all sides. But if Australia gained anything from this whole sorry affair, it was the Anzac legend. One hell of a bloke in a hat. Thousands of individual tragedies have been rolled into one lovable, brave larrikin digger. It's quite saddening, given the enormous loss involved, that the Great War has become so crucial to the evolution of Australian identity, and that with this came a further ghosting of women. This digger, painted in 1921, was not painted by a man, but a woman. Her name was Hilda Ricks Nicholas. Her tragic personal story can tell us a lot about the missing female perspectives in the canon of Australian art. I've come to meet Professor Catherine Speck at the Art Gallery of South Australia. She's an expert in the history of Australian women painters. Along comes a handsome young Australian soldier Major George Matson Nicholas. There's a whirlwind five week romance. They get married and then off he goes back to France. Five weeks later, he dies. Her world completely fell apart. Her way of coming to terms with it was in fact to paint out the trauma. Rix Nicholas's triptych Pro Humanitate was destroyed in a house fire only a photograph of the middle panel showing the moment of death of George Nicholas remains. The first panel portrayed the newly married couple and the final panel showed the grieving, desolate widow. When Rix Nicholas offered the work to the National War Museum, she was outraged to discover they only wanted the panel showing her husband's death on the battlefield. Why are they editing out the, the grieving widow? They found most of her work too personal, too much painted from a woman's point of view. We can't have that. No. And she couldn't see the centre panel without the life before death, the life after the death. 
So it's the sacrifice of women. Yes. It seems strange that a patriotic woman with first-hand knowledge of the sacrifice of war should have her grief edited from an image that would represent our country's war history. But women were finding themselves restricted in all kinds of ways. Women doctors offered their services. Women physiotherapists offered their services. And the government said, you're not needed. The frustrations and limitations placed upon women during the war inspired a more political and subversive response from one of Australia's most accomplished painters, Grace Cosington Smith. The knitting socks, that, that iconic painting, I'm sure there's a political agenda there. I'm sure Cosington Smith was aware that women couldn't go and do more. When you stand in front of that painting, Madge's eyes are down. There's almost like a defiance. All I can do is knit socks. That's what my mum used to do. It's like, mm. when yes. she's angry. Yes. It's like, so it's, there's that sense. She this never is, knitted socks. That's good. Yeah. This is all I can do. Much more than just a political statement, the sock knitter is considered to be Australia's first post-impressionist painting. But don't get too excited. It took another 70 years for this to even be recognised. The horrors of war helped to usher in modernism, which swept the European continent with art reflecting the upheavals of this era. Post-impressionism, surrealism, cubism, expressionism, futurism, abstraction, constructivism, suprematism. Meanwhile, back at the farm. Modern art was just not eagerly welcomed into this young country, paralysed with early onset nostalgia. Although in demand, pastoralism's images of well-placed logs didn't quite capture the increasingly urbane Australia of the interwar period. Let's do it. were done by women. They were painting Sydney's icon as it was being built. This marvel of modern engineering and symbol of national confidence. While most of Australia was busying itself with paddocks and fences, modernism was being snapped through the back door by a generation of female artists like Margaret Preston, Grace Cosington Smith and Jessie Traill. And a few blokes. These women and their token man colleagues were experimenting with colour, brushstroke, composition, perspective, scale and form. It could have been exciting times in the evolution of Australian art, but there were logs and trees and farms and shit that needed attention. Not only were Australia's cultural gatekeepers resistant to modernism, they were quite hostile to the concept of women artists altogether. Jace MacDonald of the National Gallery of Victoria said that women had always painted pretty badly. Lionel Lindsay, a trustee of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, asserted that the superficial nature of modern art attracts their light little hands. So here we have a bunch of women who worked very hard against the odds in often very hostile environments, making personal sacrifices in order to produce a very forward-looking vision of Australia. They sound like pioneers to me. None of these women were recognised for their work in their lifetime, but the one exception was Margaret Preston. As a female artist, Preston was an anomaly. A dogged self-promoter, she literally forced herself into the cannon. <laughs> Maggie campaigned that Australian art should cut ties with Mother England completely. And she rebelled against what she saw as the atrophy of Australian art, expressions of masculine nationalism and cliches of the bush. Preston's life quest was to create a national art, and her vision of this would radicalise the Australian landscape tradition. She was in England during the First World War. She'd engaged with modernism over there. She'd come back here, and in the 20s, she'd looked around and she said, our art is British. We don't actually have a national art. We need to look to our in Indigenous people to start developing a national art. Margaret Preston is often pilloried for appropriating Indigenous culture for the sake of her art, for mining an art form without sensitivity to its original context. It's true, she did. 
But not to the scale of Picasso. He went all crazy klepto and African culture. At least Preston's ideas were inclusive. They were way better than Tom Roberts. I mean, look at his impression of a native Australian. Although Margaret Preston's vision for a national picture was a little bit misguided, her acknowledgement and inclusion of Indigenous culture was a giant, yes, awkward and insensitive, but still a giant step forward out of ignorance and denial. Perhaps Australia really did need the little lady hands to help them mould a more inclusive vision of themselves. We need to rewrite our understandings of what is Australian art. People know who Margaret Preston is. People know who Grace Cossington Smith is. But our art histories, our narratives of our national art forms don't sufficiently acknowledge that there are men and there are women. The invisibility of women in history is a global phenomenon. But luckily for Australian women, there's plenty of evidence that great and inspiring contributions were made, even if they were largely ignored at the time. Although the Frankenstein bloke man still looms ever large in Australia, women aren't ghosts anymore. In fact, they threaten to tear down the joint and get their tiny little lady hands caught up in all sorts of business, even war. And through the eyes of contemporary artists, such as Sue, Heidi, Ben and countless others... Thanks very much yes. for your time, Yeah, pleasure. Good yeah. to meet you. It is possible to see gender playing a much more complex role in the way Australian society sees itself. In the next episode, we enter the now to see how contemporary artists are tackling our troubled history head on. And we'll see how they are reimagining what it means to be Australian in the 21st century. <laughs>